action in regards to the general care. Okay. okay. You'll be, you'll be discussing that. So we're adding that. Well, we'll <clears throat> after executive session. Right. <clears throat> okay. So, so we're not, not so, I'm experienced. <laughs> so, uh, Karen, if I can pull from for a second. Um, we told Mary that it wouldn't take action to be taken December 5th. Shut up, I don't think it was on the meeting on December is December. The 5th is the first Monday. Yeah. 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 <coughs> first Monday. Okay, yeah, yeah, December 5th. So, December 5th is when we would be working on that. Yes. Can I just say that I'm very concerned about this uh, item? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Yes, thanks, Mary. Next to the minutes, the minutes of 11 7 22. Make motion by table. I have a motion by Brian. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Judy. Is there any further discussion on these minutes? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Answer passed. Next, the uh, minutes of 11 14 22. Do I hear a motion to pass? I have a motion by Judy. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Brian. Is there any further discussion on these minutes? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> minutes are passed unanimously. Next, we have liquor control time. No liquor control, we'll move to new business. <coughs> Number one, Stuart May presentation for the community center. Yep. Welcome. Hi. Good evening. Welcome. Um, good evening. I just wanted to. I think we're going to have to go to the microphone. Oh, of course. Yeah, microphone. Yeah. Because of Zoom. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Bless you. You speak pretty loud, but I think it's. I do. I, I'm, I'm used to it, but uh, sure. So, good evening. Uh, as you may recall, I had an opportunity in April to come before a select committee as we were looking to uh, take over the community center, formerly known as E equals MC squared, and really just wanted to provide. Uh, the select board and our residents an update on where we've taken that um, and appreciate the uh, support of the town. So um, I've uh, had an opportunity to work with Judy on the presentation. Thank you, Judy. Um, so as I uh, mentioned, Lamoya Health Partners, we're the um, community health center here in Lamoya County. And uh, part of our mission is really to help residents maximize their health status. And we have this approach that we refer to as whole person care. I apologize for my back to you all. Um, and part of that and is more than just those medical type of encounters. It's looking at other parts that make us whole and what we need to balance. And physical wellness is part of that. So that was part of our reasoning for when we were approached earlier this calendar year to look at the community center and take that over. Uh, next slide, Jim. Our um, vision for the community center is really to create a place for all of our residents to come, a meeting place, a place for activities um, at no cost. So um, we are going to rely on our current operations to fund um, the center along with um, doing an um, annual appeal as well as looking to other partners, including our community and with the budget line um, to do that. Currently, the, the center um, runs around $70,000 um, under our piece, and we'll review some of those programs for you. Just to um, orientate folks, um, it's down on Union Street. Uh, it's been there, I think, since its opening, um, as far as I know. Um, and uh, next slide, please. No, that's oh, you're doing better than I do. <laughs> um, currently, oops. Currently, we're running three different programs out of there. Um, there is an after-school program geared to those 
uh, kids between the grades of five and 12. We um, will tell you that right now we really see see the sweet spot, but excuse me, sweet spot between fifth grade and tenth grade. Um, we um, also are um, looking to expand some of our offering to our seniors, and I'll talk about that this evening, as well as we've partnered with the Lamora South School District and there's life skill program to um, use the center down there as well. Judy? Um, first, the after school program uh, runs Monday through Friday, 3 to 6.30. We look to extend those hours because some of our um, parents or guardians, right, work up until 5 and 5.30 and then don't necessarily have the opportunity during the day to run some of those errands before everybody gets home. It's stressful enough and you know having a kid in tow, so we look to keep it open a little bit later to help facilitate that. Um, we've also worked with um, the students on developing programs uh, for them. Um, these programs aren't necessarily meant to just come down and hang out, but a structure to them, uh, which we'll talk about. We provide, uh, sorry for the misspelling there, we provide a healthy snack uh, free of charge for everybody um, down there. Currently, we have 80 students this academic year accessing the center. We actually opened and started providing services for the after school program in May. And right around when school let out, we hit about 65 students. Um, we also have down there, we include a behavioral health resource out of our behavioral health um, clinician service line um, to work with some of those kids. And also in partnership with Healthy Lamoya Valley, reinforcing some of those initiatives that they have both in the county and the schools. Um, it is a structured program. You can see here um, some of the activities that are set um, and we look to provide that structure um, and um, also every um, student while they're down there participates in both physical activity and there is study time. Um, one thing to mention to uh, everyone that um, part of um, the teaching that we do down there is talking about how we give back and it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, so this year Lamora Health Partners and working with others uh, in the community going into Thanksgiving um, is providing uh, meals to 15 different families of which the students down at the community center are actually boxing everything up. So they started uh, this afternoon with that in supporting our, our efforts there. Judy? On um, the seniors program, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, we did some uh, renovation. So there is a kitchen area uh, up there that um, the students, um, believe it or not, the number one request was to do some culinary work. Um, so the exact opposite of myself. Um, and um, there's also a, a physical activity area and the chill zone is really where they can come and just decompress before um, starting their afternoon with us. Uh, it's also an area where we have some of the technology set up that they can use to work on their programs or plug their Chromebooks um, into the network and along uh, with our senior program. Uh, that's also where they access it. Um, currently right now, um, we have a crew down there that uh, runs a weekly uh, table tennis um, I will tell you that it is not for the amateurs. Um, I had no idea table tennis could be so competitive other than at an Olympic level. And also technology. A bigger piece that I'm happy to report on is we are working with the council on aging to figure out other activities in partnership with them that we can bring and start to offer to um, our seniors in the community. Our challenge will be how we start to um, create access for our seniors. Uh, with lack of a public transportation infrastructure. So we may look to some partners to also say, how do we provide them outside of the physical space as well? But we want to uh, bring that to our community. Can I add something to your table tennis piece? Yes, sir. I can tell you the hill cross is one of the uh, driving forces behind that. And we, although we all play at a very elevated level, very happy to take the beginners in there. They just would love to grow the program. So. Even if you're not at that level they play at, please come and join them. Really yeah, th thank you for that. And, and actually, um, he's been a tremendous asset, and we're going to look to 
um, take up on the offer for those students that actually want to learn um, or want to elevate their game. Um, he and, and some of his colleagues are uh, willing to volunteer their time. So thank you for pointing that out, Eric. Yeah, he, um, I, I, will, I, I will say um, I uh, appreciate his patience. Um, pretty much in, um, in May when we opened up, um, he wanted to be right there with his, his team. And we said, hey, you just got to give us a little time to clean, it, clean up the area and, and figure out how we get everybody in there. So, um, But like I said, um, this is what this community is all about, right? It's not just, hey, we want a space, but hey, how can we also help and, and uh, provide some activities for these kids? So it's really great. No, uh, yes, no, this is outside of the school. This would be those that have graduated um, and um, have um, actually time on their hands. So, yeah, so there is no age limit, um, and we probably have to do a better job of, of coming up with a name because, um, you know, it could be even be folks that are, uh, I guess I'll call myself a pre-senior. How's that? <laughs> Uh, Judy, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, we um, have uh, do a lot with both Lemoyne North and Lemoyne South, um, but working with Jessica Spencer down there with their life skill program, um, we found that at the center, we could actually enrich that program uh, for those students. So uh, what we have them do is they come down, they actually learn their life skills um, in that kitchen area. And uh, we have now moved into them actually making some of the healthy snacks for them when those kids that are um, participating in the after school program, uh, if you will, to uh, actually have that. So we're excited about that partnership. Uh, there is some additional space in that building uh, that we're gonna jointly look at and perhaps bring other um, uh, equipment into that space where that life skill program can look to uh, expand. Um, lastly, <clears throat> some of the things that uh, we are working on is to continue um, supporting our students um, and providing a place for them that does provide that, that structure. Um, as I mentioned, we wanted uh, with the seniors to look to expand some of those offerings, but also look with other parts of the community to um, really expand. Uh, as I said earlier, we're really looking to create this community center for our entire community, make it a place where folks can, can meet and participate in different activities um, to improve the overall health outcomes. So I just wanted to uh, take a few minutes of your time this evening to let you know what we're doing, where that's going, and very appreciative of this entire community and the select board endorsing that budget line. So um, thank you for your time. Eric, thank you and your team for uh, helping with both this presentation and guiding us through um, some of the different groups out there to talk to and really find the needs for this community. So that's sir, it. Can you, can you yes, tell sir. Us, uh, where all of your funding comes from? Sure. For just the community center? Yeah, so that community center comes from uh, right now two revenue streams. The $15,000 uh, line item in uh, the town budget and out of our operations. So those other services that we provide, um, while we always look to reinvest them into those service lines, we made a commitment um, back in, in April when we got into this of looking at some of those um, excess revenues and reinvesting it um, here in the community center. So like I said, for our current fiscal year, um, our operating costs are $70,000. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go ahead and net that against the 15, we're covering the other 55 at this time. And did you purchase a real estate? No, so it's a rental property. Um, so in that $70,000 mm -hmm. expense uh, includes a, a monthly rent. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how marginalized students are, if they are attending the ones maybe LGBTQ community or other marginalized students. Sure. Um, so I will tell you, we're pretty agnostic from looking at that demographics. Um, but in talking to Matt Young and particularly the um, middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth, we're getting most of our students through there, which is a very diverse group. Um, so I would venture to say without the data, um, so it's a little bit more than an opinion, but uh, somewhat evidence-based that all of um, the students out of the middle school, no matter how they may identify themselves, 
are accessing the, the center. We do have a, um, a promise that we ask each uh, student and their parents to sign off on, uh, which again, creates um, the environment that we want down there and what's, uh, if you will, non-negotiable behavior. Um, but if that's something you're interested in, we can definitely look to pull that demographics to the best that our employees down there could, but we do not look to um, identify, uh, look to register, if you will, students on how they may identify themselves. And you probably know, before there was sort of like two groups, there was a group that went to the MC Square and another group that went to the UCC Church. church. Yep. The UCC Church kids were mainly the marginalized kids, okay. the LGBTQ community, and, um, and a lot more of the jocks or whatever, the Indian group sure. went to the and he yep. I don't have data on that. Right. I'm just talking about what I was aware sure. of. Sure. So I just want to know if those students who didn't feel comfortable in the other MC Square program right. are being addressed. Yeah, and, and it's through that Student Youth Advisory Committee, um, which I believe also exists in the middle school. So um, that's where a lot of um, what's being driven, not only just in the offering, but what that environment um, looks like. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and you know, that's something that as an organization we're in, uh, in tune with. So um, as we opened and educated our staff down there, those folks that even take our clinical enterprise through some of that diversity, equity, and um, inclusion training, they also went through that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Stuart? Thanks, yeah, Stuart. I just Thank, want to yeah. say that I, I, I work, you know, I'm a teacher at PA, and I do oh, okay. have students who act as a center, and it seems really good for them. So thank you. Great. Sure. Oh, no. <laughs> thank you, but great to hear. Eric, thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, uh, number two, Stephen Foster, interested in the Mono County Ground Field Program. So, Steve is one of your two representatives of the Mono uh, County Planning Commission Board. Uh, one of their uh, policies apparently over there uh, is that if uh, a member of uh, whatever community they come from, the board needs to have a vote of support for them to, uh, to join a committee. Um, we were at, on the phone today with uh, the new. Uh, newly assigned head of the Brownsfield Committee. And so there's no formal document that's on the appointment letter or anything like that. Simple vote from the board, acknowledging that Steve Foster would be a representative on the Brownsfield Committee of LCPC. It's all we're looking for here. Pretty straightforward. Okay, do you, do you need a motion? Yes, please. So moved. I have a motion by Judy. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Brian. Is there any further discussion on this motion? And just to reiterate that Stephen just doesn't represent our community. He's a representative on the board for the whole um, region, mm -hmm. right. the, the county. So <coughs> but that's what he chose to provide us with. Mm -hmm. um, is there any more? I'm just curious. Um, um, does that mean he'll be helping to like look at remediation projects and? In the county, um, in the county, yeah. Okay. Um, and looking at them and seeking them out and getting funding and just, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. The, the, the process has to go through that. Yeah, yeah. Right. great. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. Next, appointment Carrie Anderson to the Conservation Committee. So we have uh, the co-chair of the Conservation Committee here tonight, Ron. Uh, they have a, uh, an, uh, an advertising through the front porch form. Uh, they gathered four names, interested parties to fill Jennifer Andrews' vacancy. Um, of the four, two of them were asked to provide resumes uh, with their letter of interest, and two of them did that. Those two have been interviewed by the commission, and of the two, uh, Carrie Anderson, was the person chosen to serve uh, on their board, and they're looking to have her appointed tonight. Okay. Do I hear a motion regarding that? Yeah. I make a motion to approve Carrie Anderson to um, serve on the conservation committee. I have a motion by Judy and a second by Brian. Is there any further discussion on this motion? 
All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I should have asked you some questions about Sherry. Did you share just a little bit about her? Share just a little bit of information about Barbara? Yeah. Oh, and my goodness. Sherry. Oh, my goodness. 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 Oh, person who did not get it to forward a name to Judy for addition to the list that we're going to maintain for uh, future vacancies. Great. Okay. Great. But they're both very good to qualify. Well, it's great that you have four people interested. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next, Carter Grove Navy. Maury Farm Road and Hilltop Lane. These two roads, <coughs> excuse me, I thought of a see the map in your packet. Yeah. <coughs> These are the two roads that are accessed off of Beacon Hill. <coughs> excuse me. Support current for a subdivision that's currently being uh, developed. And they need names, the roads need names in order for the subdivision to be. Analyzed. Road number one, which is the one that intersects with Beacon Hill, is the Warren Farm Road. Mm -hmm. And then the second road name is the road to go off from that. Um, you see uh, it's a cul de sac and the end there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is Hilltop Lane. You would need to make motions uh, on each line that it's yeah. Is there any uh, E911 contacts? By the time I get to my desk, that then it's down to Abby's office for deconfliction and uh, so when they hit here, uh, I have not, I didn't get that word from Abby, but we set it up so that I don't have to okay. do that. Well, it doesn't come to my office for the agenda until it's down to E911. Okay. All right, do we hear motions? I'll make, the, I'll make the motion to approve the new private road. Mori Farm Road and uh, Bryce and Eric Dodge to sign on behalf of the select board. I have a motion by Don. Do I have a second? <coughs> second. Second by Judy. Is there any more discussion on this motion? Mm -hmm. And Eric, this little development is about a quarter mile, half mile above Jersey Way, uphill from there. Good by the turn, yeah. It is, uh, it appears on Beacon Hill to be just past the Mori Marvel for the Marvel property. Yeah. On the right hand side, <coughs> the Illinois house is. All right, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Oh, sorry, um, I wanted to, I had another question. Um, is it at all concerning that there's a, um, oh no, that's Moran Loop, right? Moran Loop. Okay, never mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. Next one. I'll make a motion to approve the new private road to Hilltop Lane and authorize the judge to sign that at this left work. I have a motion by Don, second by yes. Judy. Sorry. Is there any further discussion on this? So let me just add that Todd had set this definition in from our, uh, our ordinance on road naming uh, for clarification in that. Uh, at the time of the select board names, the street should provide an indication at that time that it would be accepted in the future as a public road, which directs the developer to design the new road to meet either standards for a private or public road. This is a difference between a 16 foot wide road or a 20 foot wide road, uh, with significant difference in cost. Um, at this time, I, I have, this is the only plan that I have is this is the one road with a cul de sac at the end. I know this is part of a larger development, or the intent of for it to be part of a larger development. Do we have any representation from the folks? I, I represent uh, the owner. Okay. How are you, sir? Good, thanks. Is that the step up in the future, though? Yeah, sure. So the determination is, uh, I'll read further here, the determination of whether or not you're going to uh, give them some nod for the future takeover or not takeover of the town highway. 
is based on proposed streets. Um, if the select board determined that said road fails to serve a public purpose, it should remain private as a result of private road penalty shall be executed and recorded for said street for the town or said road policy. So there's a determination of public good that needs to be made. And I don't have enough information to give you tonight to say that there's a definite determination of public good to at least how I have one street. I don't know what the rest of the design looks like. And I didn't probably get any indication on that stuff. So what I'm seeing is the subdivision that is currently laid out with uh, six building lots. I, I, I presume there are many more. Plan. There are only eight proposed at this point. Eight more proposed? Yeah. So. And are you aware of a standard, you know, if, if uh, the owners wanted to have it product taken over by the town, then um, the developer has to bring it up to the, the specs of the, the town standards. And then we would have a site walk and we would discuss it, make sure, you know, check with their highway superintendent, make sure that it is in fact, everything is covered, all the criteria, and then we may or may not, you know, approve it as a town road. But that's how it usually goes for the sure. I think I'm, I'm generally aware. I mean, at this point, we're, we're conceiving them as private roads. Um, Tyler Mumley is our engineer. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, so I've uh, entrusted the details to him as to, um, as to the details as to whether these become, whether these are going to be built to town road specs or not. Um, so at this point, I mean, it is, you know, they're serving eight lots basically. So. Okay. And it, it is a, uh, the way I read the, the ordinance, the new ordinance is, we can make that determination now or can be made later. It's not set in stone if it isn't made now. Well, I, I can tell you the problem with this is that I'm going to use Belange Road as a prime example. Belange Road, when it was developed, first built, came for the select board for the same determination. And the board at the time said, yeah, we'd love to take that bridge. It's a great road. They built a road 24 feet wide uh, all the way to the end. And then the town road policy changed with a select board decision to not take on dead end roads. And it sat that way for a very long time until the board that I sat on in, I think it was 2017, changed the road policy back to accepting dead end town roads uh, as a result of a large development that was planned for the town and it was to serve the public good. So we changed the road policy back then. So your policy currently says you'll take on dead end roads. It doesn't mean the future select board will change the policy yet again and say we're only going to take take on roads that connect to town highways or whatever it may be. There's many different versions around the state. So um, I'm going to sit with Todd tomorrow and just talk to him about our, our ordinance here and just discuss that portion of it because for one board to make a determination on a project that no dirt's been turned over yet is difficult for the developer because there's a significant dollar difference between 16 feet wide and 24 feet wide. And the indication is the 16 feet wide is the private road to the dimension they're looking at currently. But if they determine that they're going to leave enough width there in their uh, development, development plans, that eventually someday they could build out to a 24 foot road. Again, there, there are many differences. An indication by a board now doesn't mean the board later would determine the same outcome. Policies change. So I think it's difficult for developers. I think our ordinance does not, does not work well for developers. If uh, the gentleman is here representing the owners by saying, no, we really want it to be a public highway when we get this finished. I think you'd be hard pressed to guarantee that could happen because of the real policy can change. We're also up against many stormwater changes, as you know, uh, and stormwater belt. And that I can tell you will change in your road policy. Because as the developments come on board, the state says, hey, you've got too much impervious surface here. You're going to be required to put in storm drains and a selling pond and whatnot. That will be built in your next road policy revision that I'm working on. That the developers will have put in there that the cost of those annual inspections and cleanings will be borne by the development owners or an HOA because they're popping up more and more and more. And uh, the whole town's the whole town tax base shouldn't be 
tax, in my opinion, should not be held accountable to pay for the cost of servicing a development uh, and, and cleaning out their stormwater drains. But, but right now, this is to approve a private building that's 16 feet wide. Is that well, I mean, this, this, is, the, this is not, this is 16 feet wide. And Correct. What our ordinance says, as Todd gave us to Judy late today, so I presume he wanted me to address it tonight. This this says, as a part of the road naming, that the board will give an indication to the developer. That we will give an indication. Oh, Careful for the horse. Yeah. In a sense, it is. It's way before it is. It's so I'm going to talk to Todd tomorrow about this ordinance because I don't need to throw our developers. We don't even know they're investing. Do it. They're investing millions, or hundreds of thousands of dollars. In our community, I don't think the ordinance is uh, is fair to that. I think if you give them a bad indication to start with, they put a lot of money up front, and then the policy changes, and we don't want to do this. Anyway, it sounds like they're looking at private road development at this point. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's an issue here. I'm just forewarning you that this this may have to change. I don't think it's written well. Well, I don't believe that any board here should sit here in the future. In fact, I think I yeah. remember a long time ago that we weren't allowed to make something that could make a burden on the next select board. Because we could make a motion tonight to do something, and it, if, and then the next board say no, we're not done, like you said. So I think my th thoughts are that they decided they thought they wanted to do that. They should be putting the right size call works away and have a crowd. Exactly. You know, do all that. <clears throat> then come to us and uh, that's my thought. That's what I say, the character for the horse. Yes. If I was that developer and I thought, well, maybe I'd like to have it be a town road someday, first thing I do is make it 24 feet wide, make sure your storm drains are there, your culverts, then down the road it could happen. But well, right you now they they're coming to us on Jess's point, Jess's question. They're coming to us. But a private road, a 16 foot private road. Mm -hmm. right, so that's that's all, that's all it's it's just a name. And the motion no, that we, we have now is it. just for, just for that. Just a name. It's, it's really up to the road. It's up to the developers in the future to decide whether or not they want to stick with a 16 foot road or a 24 foot road. Exactly. I mean, I agree, we can't make a decision on what could happen in the future. Is that the way you, you see it too? Yeah, I mean, I, at this point, you know, there's uh, lots of, um, we're still, you know, drawing lines and maps mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, so at, what we know, what we think we know at this point, or our assumptions, are is that there will be an HOA. Um, one of the HOA's responsibilities will be to maintain the private road. Um, you know, the roads as constructed, and if you know the, the topography and the, the location of the parcel, um, the likelihood that these will become through roads to connect to another town road, I think, is low. Um, you know, the, the entrance points and access points to this parcel are somewhat limited. Okay. Who are you? You haven't identified yourself. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Damon Lee. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lee's yeah. name is on your application. I was guessing. Yes. I've seen your name in your email. Yes, we've been, uh, yes. <laughs> we appreciate you coming in. Thank you. So with the mo there's a motion on the floor right now yeah. to accept Hilltop Lane. <clears throat> Hilltop or Morey? Hilltop. We did Morey already. Yeah. Okay. It's Hilltop Lane now. Right. So is there any further discussion on this? <clears throat> We've already approved Morey, which was just the short road to access Hilltop. Right. <coughs> so all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed the end Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Next, the liquid tax sale. Fair up. This is the part I hate most about my job, for the record. <laughs> so um, I think you all have the list of um, Figures, this is as of four o'clock this afternoon. These are the property owners that didn't pay um, for last year. So we're talking about um, 21, 22 taxes, not the ones that were due like two weeks ago. There are um, 
14 parcels still. Jim Barlow, our tax attorney, had sent all demand letters. Um, and these are the people who have still not paid up since that time. So I'm bringing them to you to see if you would like to proceed with um, tax sale. Typically what um, the board has done in the past is um, they've set a dollar figure. It costs, Jim says about an average about $900 in attorney fees for tax sales. Um, in the, per parcel. Per parcel. 15% um, of that can be recru recouped in tax sale. Um, but the rest is the burden of the town. Um, so in the past, um, the board has voted a limit of either a thousand or two thousand, sort of depending, looking down the limit. Um, there's two properties that are currently in redemption for the year before taxes that they still haven't paid back. I'm not sure how that goes into play, but Jim will know. Um, and then there's the ones in blue, and then the one in yellow has applied to that. Um, the, the money that I keep mentioning, the, the, the help, so there's a pending application, so nothing can be done about that property until um, it's determined by the state if they'll qualify and will get the funding or not. And you said, sorry, um, you said that $900, um, $900 per sale to, um, to Follow through with the tax sale. Average. Average. And then so we can only do 15 percent. Mm -hmm. So where does the rest of the money go for the it goes back to the money? Oh no, so let so um basically the lower ones are not worth pursuing. Yeah. So it could cost us for the one that's only fourteen dollars that they owe us. It oh, okay. it could cost us nine hundred dollars in tax sale, yeah. but we will only get fifteen percent of what's owed. It's right. I Are would oh. yeah I wouldn't recommend. Mm -hmm. um, so past precedent would be something like we would um, conduct tax sales on property owners that owe let's say over a thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In this case, we're getting, you said 15% back, we would get back of the 900? Of, I think it's of the of the balance that they owe. Of the balance, the balance that they owe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know we've done a thousand before. To, for the most part, it's typically been a thousand. So that's you're looking for from us. Yeah, is a motion um, to sign an engagement letter with um, to authorize the chair to sign an engagement letter with Jim Barlow, and then um, a set amount, or if you're going to send them all, or. Do you have a motion to bear? I do. I do. I'll make a motion to authorize the select board chair to sign an engagement letter with Jim uh, Attorney Jim Barlow to conduct tax sales for all property owners that are in arrears of $1,000 or more. Okay, I have a motion by Don, do we have a second? Second. Second by Judy. Is there any further discussion on this motion? Do we, do we know of any financial circumstances for any of these people? Like, uh, severe health issues or anything like that? Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the properties that owe less than a thousand dollars? I continue to spend money to send letters. I get to pay a thousand of those letters. Um, I, I'm appointed as delinquent tax collector, so actually you guys have to tell me what to do. I'm not elected. <laughs> So I can send letters. I don't have to send letters. I can send them at certain time. Um, so two of the properties in blue, you haven't paid your taxes for two years. Yeah, I need to talk to Jim Barlow about what the process is for the two of them and if we can take them up for tax sale or if we have to wait. The redemption period is in January. If we have to just wait until after that, I'm, I'm not sure. What does that mean? So if um, a person loses their house at tax sale, they have 12 months to redeem it. To pay it back. To pay it back and plus interest. Okay. Well, that's true. 
Mm-hmm. And, and with a tax sale goes up, the tax sale is only for the amount they owe on taxes, basically. Correct. So um, people can bid higher than that. And if they do, then the excess fund is held in escrow and it's actually interest bearing. And then um, if it gets redeemed, the um, it gets um, like a pl- applied to the balance due. Okay. So any other discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm-hmm. Oh, just pass. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Number six, higher park line, temporary AEMP. Dr. Collin. So the next three are mine, so I'll just step forward now. Paula Beatty, Human Resource Director. Um, we are looking to hire a part-time temporary person, Hunter Hellman, to um, backfill a position just for a short period of time through December 9th um, for an individual who has been a long-term um, part-time employee who is out for a until this morning. And when you read the motion, I'm not sure who's going to read the motion. Can you just um, include that Eric can sign on behalf of the select board? Yep. Okay. I move to hire Hunter Tolman in the MS department as a part time temporary AEMT employee at a rate of $15 per hour for the period of November 11th, 2022 to December 9th, 2022. Should the terms of the part-time temporary employee agreement need to be extended, the authorizer does the town administration extend the terms through January 31st, 2023. We'll give Eric permission to sign to hire um, Hunter Tall. Okay, a motion by Judy, is there a second? Second. Second, second by John. Any further discussion? <clears throat> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Watch us pass unanimously. Thank you. And on number seven, hire Highway Tech 2 Scott Nelson. So, in the transition from my previous position to this position, <laughs> he um, sort of slipped through the cracks, and I apologize. So, there's a motion to, he has been hired, so there's a motion to hire him retro to his date of hire. Do we, do we need anything? No, this is just a normal hire process. Yeah. I move to hire Scott Nelson from the highway department as a tech to depth driver at a rate of $22.61 per hour with a retro hire date of October 24th, 2022. Thank you. I have a motion by Judy. Is there a second? Second. Second by Any further discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. Thanks, Paul. Are you doing the personal policy? I am. Pass the next. Yes. So you will see in front of you, um, it should say actually personal policy and longevity policy. So we'll start with the longevity policy. Um, Tina updated that, and you'll see in the motion it's just to um, remove because we're no longer doing um, steps by grade, we're doing it by position. So it's just to make that change. So the red, all the red is struck. Yeah, that's the personnel policy. So there's the longevity. There's a sheet yeah. that says longevity. So that one's first. And then so there's a motion. Exactly. And there's a motion for that. Is somebody ready with the motion? Yeah. I move to approach to approve this proposed longevity pay policy change <laughs> as presented to remove grade and add job time. All right, and a motion by Don, is there a second? Second. Second by Judy. Any further discussion on this motion? So this is separate from the personnel policy? Yes. Okay. Can you just, you already explain the reason that we changed We are now, so we would normally do step increases by grade. We've removed the grade and now we're doing our step increases by job title. 
Oh, the non-union pay scale. Yes. It used to be a great step process, but when I started, I think a year ago, it changed. It took away the grade. It, it made no sense to me. And I really had no foundation or anything. Okay. So we broke it out by job title okay. and then put them on there uh, with the appropriate level of pay for the responsibility of positions. And the grade was based more on like seniority and job titles were based on like qualifications. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't I don't know the grade. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see that we're going to do the roof okay, with the personnel policy. But it's, okay. everything's geared towards the job titles now. Gotcha. Um, and it's easier to identify. So mm -hmm. that's, and, and when we're talking, it's easier to talk about a position right. versus a, a grade on right. some wage scale. Right. And it makes maybe more sense for certain positions. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, is there any more discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Motion is passed unanimously. <clears throat> next is the oh, personnel policy. Yeah, so the next is the personnel policy. Um, you will see the red and blue document that I provided to you. The red is us um, deletions and the blue is additions. Uh, Tina, Eric, and I have over the last several weeks been looking at the personnel policy. Um, and in doing so, we've identified some areas. There's still areas um, in the future that we will continue to improve upon, but for now, these are the ones that are our priority. Um, so on the first page, you'll see, which is very simple, it's um, for whatever reason, there's been a constant list of when the personnel policy has been presented to and amended. So we're removing that and just going to put the date that it's presented. And then um, in the footer, you'll see the effective date and the approval date. It's just, again, it's just more the formality of it. Okay. Um, and then on page two, uh, I have a finalized document if you um, approve all of the changes that has a finished um, table of contents, this depends on where this conversation goes because if you delete or add anything that I have deleted or added, then um, it will change those page numbers. So on page three, um, under the persons covered, we have removed, you will see, um, we have removed a section that is regarding um, employees working 35 or more hours as full time. And now we're focusing just on the full time, part time, and we've added um, the volunteers in there as part of the covered personnel. I think after a discussion we had two weeks ago. Yes. Yeah. Where does it, um, where do you, where did you add the? We just deleted out? that red section. Okay. And is it, is, was it added in somewhere else? No, no, sorry, the volunteers is, that was there, it's just removing that 35 hours uh, piece about full time employees are benefited after 35 hours. We removed the, that section just. So is new, what is the new policy? Is there a new policy now? It's like, just going to read where the black is. The red is going to be deleted. I think what she's asking is there a replacement for what's being deleted. Is there any no. 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 You'll see anything in blue is what we're adding. Red is deletion. Okay. Blue is what is being added. You'll see on additional pages. So there won't be a definition of full-time and part-time. Right, that's a new policy. No. Why cover? We wanted to remove the 35 hours because it was causing concerns with individuals feeling that they could work for a full-time status at 35 hours. Okay. So we wanted to remove that because we had some individuals that were not fulfilling the 40 hour a okay. week. So we wanted to move the 30, remove the 35 hours. Well, is, but is, it, is there a reason why there isn't like a definition of like full-time is 40 hours? Like because we have, we have varying amounts. So currently we have our rescue squad, it's a great example. We have our uh, part-time uh, partial benefit employees up there who are authorized to work up to 29 hours a week. Okay. That's based on the law that says if we have any more hours, they have to provide health care. Oh, okay. So it works out fine because those folks work two shifts per week. Yeah. 
prior to this, before we gave them partial benefits, they were only allowed to work 23 hours a week because they work 24 hours a week on a continuous basis. Then they're eligible to go on the Beamer's retirement or retirement system. Mm -hmm. So we changed that some months ago to 29 hours, gave them partial benefits. And um, so brought them up. So it's the definition of that job has changed to 29 hours versus 24. So each of the positions themselves is described in the job description. That's just what they're going to be, what they are, what they, uh, what the job entails and uh, the hours required. Because there's such a flexibility in the hours, we're trying not to make it driven by the hours of somebody. This, this portion of this policy was the 35 hour mark was developed 25 years ago, mm -hmm. based around one employee here in this building. That employee retired probably 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, this remained in the policy and untouched. And only recently we had someone who's who's taken the policy to to a well, definition and uh, we work a 40 hour week. They work a 35 hour week, but they're getting their benefits the same rate that folks that are working 40 hours are because they're considered full time employees. It's a it's terribly language, terrible language, and policy should not be built around individuals. So. Mm -hmm. uh, we all removed this in order to fully define full time expectations 40 hours per week. Okay, I'm just, I guess I just, I, I don't mean to be getting, um, I'm hammering this down, um, but I just don't see where the actual full time and part time definition is substituted. Like it just seems like it's not anywhere. But mm -hmm. I think I have the same question, yes. Jess, and I think the answer might be that it's I'm glancing through here. There's, Would it there's be safe so, to say that full time and part time definitions don't exist in the policy? Well, they're not so in the cover piece, but there are areas throughout the personnel policy that reference benefited employees at you know more than twenty four or more than or at forty. For here, I think we're really excuse me really looking at we do have the one example that eric is talking about an individual working 35 hours a week who is considered a full-time employee is earning as much eto as someone who is working 40 hours so that's what we're really trying to address we're trying to make sure that we have an accountability for those individuals that are supposed to be working full-time at 40 hours right. because they're working 35 hours getting the same exact benefits as somebody that's 40 hours. The ETO is a perfect example. You know, if you're working 35 hours, I'm working 40, you're getting the same ETO accrual rate that I'm receiving. So in this section, where we're trying to remove that and just say part-time and full-time, and then you'll see throughout other areas where it sort of talks about that benefited at 40 or um, above 24 for the VMAs. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking there perhaps is a compromise here that we leave the first sentence of that paragraph in place. Of the one that we're excluding mm -hmm. for the 40 hours? We could do that. For the purpose of this policy, a full-time employee is an employee who works 40 hours per week on a regular daily basis. And then, and then the leave paragraphs. Yeah. And we, if you want us to come up with it. First-time employee is not eligible for benefits as an employee who works less than 30 hours per week. I mean, I just, I, I, I just want to be like have a policy where it's clear that someone could be like. We could leave the less than twenty three because right now it's twenty four and above. It's twenty four uh -huh. to up to twenty nine for other individuals because when you start um, mm -hmm. allowing individuals to work over thirty hours, then we get into the health insurance. Mm -hmm. You have to legally provide health insurance for employees that work over thirty hours. And that is a whole different budget that we'd be right. looking at for right. individuals. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I'm thinking too. Is like, so would, would it be smart to leave the definition of a part time employee? A part time employee is not eligible for benefits as an employee who works less than X number of hours. I would that one now. I'm very yeah, not eligible. Less than 23. 23 and below. It seems like we want to be covering ourselves. I don't know. I don't know. I think we've, I, it, our concern is uh, our full time day to day. Even though the policies cover all, uh -huh. um, we can describe in here what we currently have, although it may change. So I don't, right. I'm not sure the benefit of describing 
<coughs> what our part-time employees with benefits looks like. Well, I mean, I guess if I were looking at, like, if I started a new job, or if I were looking at getting hired in some place, that would be the first thing I'd look at, like, how many hours do I work for the benefits? And that's what we would provide to you in a conditional offer. So in that, when we offer employment to individuals, right. they know what they're going to be starting at. Okay. They know their position. They know the rate of pay that they're going to be starting at. Right. They know if they're benefited or not benefited. Right. So that's part of the orientation, the pre-hire, I guess, um, the hiring practice. Um, and then that's something that we do through the orientation. There are other sections, as I had previously said, um, <clears throat> where it refers to um, under the benefit section when an employee qualifies for benefits. So we should take this home and read it mm -hmm. rather than sit here fixing the fire. You could absolutely do that. Because I, I see right there where you go, oh, I got to go. <laughs> you've got right there where yeah. 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the last five sentences in that, the five lines in that, is a description of what makes you eligible or not eligible for retirement. Uh, retirement. That's the only reason it's in there. And it really serves no purpose to our personnel. The description is that when you receive benefits or not receive benefits is given during your conditional offer as part of your job description. Mm -hmm. The personnel policy doesn't need to describe a part-time employee. If they're not working 40 hours a week, they're a part-time employee. Full-time employees are 40 hours. Anything less than that would be considered a part timer. So I don't know the <laughs> definition by hours that they work. This paragraph is simply put in there uh, in the means of describing uh, that breaking point of 24 hours makes you eligible for femurs. And, and it really serves no purpose in this paragraph because it doesn't. I mean, if an employee read this, they wouldn't have a clue that it has to do with retirement. And, and there's no, no time in here to retirement. We know what it means. Could, could we could we could, could we continue um, and see if it works for us to review this? And if it doesn't, yeah. then you can bring this home. Because um, I'm looking, there's a section that I I need to. Um, there's a date that is applied to this, uh -huh. um, and so I think the majority of it. Well, I had assumed um, <laughs> it goes smoothly. <laughs> um, so the next the next section is number is uh, page four. Um, there was a very small section that addressed nepotism. Mm -hmm. I reached out to Vermont uh, VLCT and asked for uh, policies, their policies mm -hmm. on nepotism, and they provided two. I presented uh, one of the two to Eric and Tina for approval. They agreed. So this verbiage is straight from the LCT mm -hmm. on the nepotism. <clears throat> on um, page five, there's uh, section 16, the use of town equipment and vehicles. There was uh, no area in the town personnel policy that um, reference employees use of town vehicles so again i reached out to vlct and did some research through shurum um, and took a number of policies and compiled the data entered you know inserted it into the personnel policy and again tina and eric reviewed it and they felt that it addressed as do i um, the areas of Employees using town equipment and town vehicles. We're going to make it active today because if somebody did, as Eric had actually mentioned earlier today, if there if we had an employee two months ago that had a staff or a family member in the vehicle with them, and we backdate this to be effective prior to that, somebody is in violation that didn't even know that they were in violation. So. So that's uh, section five, in, or page five and page six, and then it goes on to page seven. I believe that we've covered all areas of that. Um, on page seven, the eligibility for benefits, this is where it does um, reference employees working 24 hours or more um, being eligible. Um, they've changed a uh, much in this section other just than just making the language read a little bit 
better removing a couple of words, adding a couple of words, no major changes to that section. So that covers what you're missing. Yeah, in right. the first part. Yes. It, yes. So, We're just trying to simplify things yeah. because the management. Well, this first, no, right? I did. I did say okay. that it references the benefits of a later date. Did well, I, I think I did. It's um, just, so I've worked in places where 32 hours is Yes. So, I mean, I, I do think it's important to, to have the. Yep. Yes, yeah. and we can, we, can that. we can put it back in there. Um, so, yes, the eligibility for benefits, like I said, we didn't change um, much there, just the language, cleaning it up, making it a little bit easier to read. Um, on section 19, the mandatory direct deposit, um, and doing, again, some research, we cannot make it mandatory. It's not legal to make it mandatory to do direct deposit. So we have changed the language to read strongly encouraged. Um, so we did change mandatory, it's like social uh, mandatory should be crossed out. Okay, it should so say so strongly so. encouraged. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then in section 20, um, we've inserted the human resource because it's a new department, and you'll see that in a few. Uh, well, let's, let's slow down for just a moment, please. Let's give the board a chance to digest this stuff. We're trying to way too fast. This is a large <laughs> document. You're making majors a different change. Well, are they gonna, you're going to take it home and yeah, read it as well? Here. Along those lines, is there a need to approve this tonight? We yeah. approve it at any point in time. We do have uh, the change here where I get to that has a monetary that has a date, to it. Mm -hmm. a date impact. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. So in the section twenty, um, yeah. and just Beamer's retirement uh, on Plan D, so it's page eight, section twenty, Plan D. We just added the police and the detective lieutenant. Again, just adding a couple of, you know, making uh, the positions a little bit clearer. And then we added the town administrator because the town administrator is um, eligible for Beamer's DC, which was not previously on there. And we pay into Beamer's? The employee um, contributes as well as the employer. So we added positions to that. Just to clarify it a little bit more, because it just said on, under Plan D, it just said the police chief, mm -hmm. and the police and the detective and lieutenant are also covered. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not really an actual change. Okay. No. It doesn't change like the percentage of the employees or the employers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, holidays, we added the Juneteenth and then <coughs> made the adjustment for the Indigenous People Day. Um, on page nine, we, um, under the holiday leave, we added um, just that the ETO and holiday would count towards overtime. We've removed some verbiage. Again, some of this language we removed um, was just to make it a little bit clearer. Some of it was inserted um, 10, 20 years ago. The earned time off is um, probably more of a focus than some of the other sections. Um, we are requesting, so the earn time off and um, the section on the sick reserve. Um, the sick reserve is an account that we are looking to um, end. And so they sort of, um, the ETL and the sick reserve goes sort of hand in hand with what we're proposing. So we're looking to end the sick reserve. Um, it's a very, it's the way that it was set up and the language is very subjective. Um, and it requires um, the town administrator to decide when and sort of, or basically when an employee is allowed to use that time. Um, well, I'd like to jump in on this mm -hmm. one. 
This is probably the most complex chain we've had. The, the, the sick reserve, as it's called, uh, I, have, I have never liked. We, we changed back in the early 2000s to earn time off payroll or a benefit stimulation system. Sick bank was the terminology used then to allow employee non-union, this is non-union employees. The sick bank was there for folks to, to gain sick time, as we gain our sick time every pay period. But it wasn't incorporated in the ETO because ETO, we are required by law to pay out employee ETO on separation or retirement. Sick leave back in the early 2000s had an unlimited cap to it. But by law, you're not required to pay out sick leave. So they were kept separate. Jump ahead a few years, there were issues with employees, longer term employees, losing ETO. They had taken up ETO. So they changed the sick bank and called it the sick reserve. They capped it at 96 hours. 320. For 320 hours, sorry. After 320 hours, and it became a dumping ground for earned time off that was going to be lost at the end of the year. So the intent of ETO is to eliminate these other banks that are floating out there and create one bank of earned time off that is managed by the employees and overseen by the supervisors in such a manner that we want our employees to take their time off. We want them fresh. We want them to get a break. Uh, and we don't want them to lose their time. So the problem we're running into is that folks were losing large amounts of time. And we, lot, we ran into that this year. One of our things <coughs> losing over 200 hours of earned time off. It's unacceptable. It's also a reason that you'll see in the budget season I'm looking to add a position in that, in that department. Anyhow. As it relates to this, that sick reserve has a stipulation that the time that's in there can only be used if the town administrator authorizes it. So I guess I'm in the position of determining whether or not somebody's sick enough to use the time that they have earned. And that's wrong. Absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. Further on the, the sick reserve, that time came from ETO Bank. That ETO time, we're required by law to pay out, and we're now having to put it into a bank that we don't have to pay out, unless you retire, because that's how it's written. If you retire after 20 years, you can get 75% payout. If you're 25 years, you get 100% payout. But if you left after 15 years, you don't get paid out. And I, I, to me, there's, a, there's something illegal about that, although I can't find where it's written that's illegal. It just feels right. Excuse me for something. Um, I, I would like to see the sick reserve go away. We have uh, how many employees called? So I met with um, all uh, of the how employees. Many, how many seven. employees? They have seven employees seven. currently with hours in the seven sick seven. reserve. Okay. In order to eliminate the hours that are in there, we, we came up with a plan with three options for them to choose from in order for us to eliminate the sick reserve. But it all hinges on our ability to increase the amount of ETO time that we allow employees to gain and carry over from year to year. Currently, they're about 240 hours. That's ETO. That would be sick, personal, vacation, all in one bank, easier managed by the supervisors and overseen. The sick reserve would, would go away. No longer be able to contribute to it. So it just it, it goes. When we look to like to increase the accrual rate from 240 to 320, that takes it from six full weeks, six work weeks, 40 hours a week, to eight work weeks. So it's it's a it's a combination of different pieces here in order to achieve this elimination of this bank that can just sit there and sit there and sit there, but has this subjective nature to it or deciding who gets music when, and the payout comes in a percentage. I mean, if you're just something to me, if it feels wrong, then there's something wrong. And I, I try to look at this from different angles to find it to be right, and I can't. So I'm asking the board to consider to eliminate the sick reserve, and I'll let Paul explain the three different options <clears> on <throat> how to do that. 
So they're on page 11. They're actually in the first paragraph. So one would be for the employees to um, keep the hours that they have in their sick reserve and be paid out 100% upon separation or um, retirement. The second option would be a 100% cash payout, the first payroll of July of 2023, because we need to budget accordingly. And then the last option, um, because we have individuals that have from 20 hours to 320, so the last option would be for employees to transfer the hours that they have into their sick bank into their current um, ETO bank. And one of the, you know, the reasons for increasing the ETO from 240s, 320s, also the accrual rate of some of the senior employees that have been here, um, they accrue at a, at a high rate and they get to that June, the end, you know, into June of every year and they're having to take their ETO and either get paid out two for one or they're having to convert it into that sick reserve. So we're trying to encourage, yes, the additional um, time off for the employees, but allowing them a little more flexibility with what they can carry forward without putting a huge, people start stressing when they're gonna start losing or they know that they have to convert it into um, a bank that has all these stipulations and is very subjective. It's a lot of my It's too much of my mm -hmm. 22 pages of revisions. We can spend another two hours on that. You know, I mean, it'd be good to go through it a little bit and then go back and like Brian said, I was read it. Mm -hmm. I can't even digest the last four pages. Of it. There's a lot to go through. There is. I know you guys have done a ton of work, mm -hmm. but you can't expect us to go through all this and say, okay, this is good, 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 let's go. Yeah, no. And I, I'm and, thinking about what Jeff said. Yeah, no, and I don't, I don't, I don't think that any of us are looking for that necessarily. Um, it's just a lot. It is a lot for one and night. It's a, and it is, and it's a lot of, and it's a lot of work. Um, kind of work. And there's, you know, constant moving pieces. I mean, some honestly, there's a section um, on the travel that I just, um, you know, inserted today because we're trying to, but. I can leave this with you to look at. I think the the part, some of this is um, explaining it so that if you do take it, uh, you're taking it back and you're reading it, you kind of have some, I guess, the baseline of information right. so because it can right. be very hard to read through it and understand it, especially when you're looking at, you know, the blue lines are inserts and the red lines are what's Why being deleted. Exactly. So I think it's helpful helpful for us to go through it. I apologize that I was going through it fast. I also know people don't want to stay here for it's, hours. Um, so I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for that. So the ETO and the sick reserve, I think, are the more important. And it's all important, but these those two are extremely um, important because it impacts employees' time off yeah. and the way that they're going to be able to carry it forward um, and what we're proposing for them. Well, it reminds me, too, in the past when people have retired long-term employees, <clears throat> they got big checks when they left. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we had to make changes for that, too. Well, the thing that's, uh, we have uh, considerations here for <clears throat> employees who retire from the town for uh, you know, in the union contracts, where there's scarce food simply. Right. Uh, we've always tried to adopt policies governing pay and benefits for our non union employees that were at least similar in design to what the union employees are receiving. Right. Um, I, I have two unions that I negotiate with currently, I don't know, I have three. <clears throat> uh, so we're looking to try and balance the scales here a little bit and bring a fairness to it while also looking at from the administrative side of the house, eliminating a sick reserve bank that really is a cash cow. Um, that money, that the sick leave can be earned in you know, an individual's uh, the first eight to ten, five to 10 years of, say, of their career. They can, at the end of the year, they've got some hours they may be losing, so they throw it in the sick reserve. <coughs> 15 years later, they retire at a much higher rate of pay, and they've got a full sick reserve that 
get the cash out 100% and put it in the And once you get rid of, let's get rid of the set reserve, but increase the ETO accrual by two weeks, thereby eliminating that cash cow. 320 hours, it's earned one rate and paid out on a much significantly higher rate and give the employees two more weeks of ETO time, which is a balance of six personal and vacations, not just taking eight weeks of vacation a year. <clears throat> because if you take eight weeks of vacation in a year, God bless you, but if you get sick, you're not going to get a paycheck. That felt pretty firm on since I started here. I want people to take time off. I want them to manage their time off. I want them to be healthy, and I don't want to see ETL walks at the end of the year. Uh, I think it makes for a stronger workforce when we do that. We watch it from the management side of the house and, and help them to understand. And, you know, you might want to think about taking a week off. Do, do people get a set amount of sick vacation and personal time? No. So they it's earn their e yeah. They, so the ETO is earned based on the years of service. So one and there's a section in uh, it's actually under the ETO section that says zero through four you earn at this rate, five through nine you earn at this rate, ten through nineteen you earn at this rate, and then at twenty hours and more you earn at X rate. Um, another, you know, kind of adding on to what Eric says with that sick reserve as well. We have the town pays for. Um, a short-term disability for the employees. So if an employee is out, they get paid 66.67% of their salary up to 26 weeks. So again, it's, I mean, that's there to protect um, the employee where that sick reserve is, it's very subjective. It puts, you know, the burden on to Eric to say, yes, Judy can take the time off because she has this illness or, right. And then you, then you have a discrimination case. So I think that there's a number of things um, that need to be addressed with that sick reserve. And keeping in mind that the town does provide that um, the short term <clears throat> disability and you have the FMLA and there's there's other you know state um, benefits as well. So for the first first four years someone's working here they accrue ninety two hours per year of time Earn their earn time. They can yes. get a sick vacation person. They can use it however they would like. Mm -hmm. They don't have to sell anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then to just, um, I think the next few pages will be honestly rather quick. So the um, page 11, the workers' comp um, section is just because some of this um, address the sick reserve account in it, it's removing that from that, that section. Um, and then travel under um, section 26, we did not have a travel uh, section in our personnel policy as to um, the approval process or reimbursement process when an employee is travel, traveling. And it's, um, it's come up a few different times and this would um, address it and make it consistent for all employees, which is the next couple of pages. I would point out in that travel policy, the piece that uh, <coughs> we, we came up with, like played around with Google Maps a little bit, uh, using the state of a lot of my guide, where we typically see different people, uh, different employees going to trainings and whatnot. And so if you draw a circle, uh, everything is calculated from the place of work. Okay, so Center Marshtown, let's use this office. I'm going to go to a training in uh, Brandon. Okay. So Brandon is over an hour and a half away. It's over 60 miles away. I would be eligible to attend that training. And if it's a two-day training, multi-day training, I'd be eligible to be reimbursed for overnight, an overnight stay. And per diem as well, per diem. Okay. So if it's a one-day training, there's an exception in there for one-day training, that you, that you are not authorized in overnight stay for a one-day training. You still get up earlier and leave earlier. But at the very end of that portion, you'll see, I added the line in there, any exception to this policy must be approved by the administrator. 
because I'm also aware that the police officers I Authorize them to spend the money. But by and large, one day trainings, conferences, stuff like that around the state of Vermont, you can get to and back with reasonable driving time on either hand. So I'm not looking to authorize overnight stays for a trip to, you know, a regular junction. And again, I, um, this policy, if you are familiar with Sherm at all, um, it's, you know, again, I went on there and um, their policies that are used um, very widely. And so that's where this came from. Um, it also addresses the um, lines, which I think is really important. Their employee going to a different conference and they're having dinner, it says what they're both going to be reimbursed and it's going to be fair and equal. Right now, we don't have anything that addresses that. So if a staff member goes out to a conference and they, you know, buy a $10 dinner, that's what they're going to be reimbursed. And you have the other employee that buys a $20 dinner, that's what they're going to be reimbursed. It's, that's the standard of um, fair reimbursement. And then um, I have a section on uh, page 14. The next section, 30, is the hardship leave um, for... I'm not sure Tina would know the history of um, the process where employees were allowed to donate time to another employee due to a hardship. The process, um, the bookkeeping piece of that, um, it, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and the, historically, the way that it's been done, um, um, I think that it would need more work to manage that than it is to... ETO for individuals um, throughout. There was another section that was very subjective. Um, very subjective. And, you know, when you when you determine you put the email out asking for people to tell me ETO through <laughs> And they come to us and say, hey, I have a hardship here. I have an ETL and it's sick and we out for a while. Well, that's all about managing ETO time. And that's all about the oversight from the supervisor saying, hey, you know, you're, you're pretty low on your ETO. Perhaps you should, you know, think about this and you make, you just make a conscious conversation. But it's, uh, to me, it was who, who determines whether or not we send out the email asking for a donation of ETO? Uh, it, it just doesn't feel good. I go about that. It tells me there's something weird there. I didn't like the donation of ETO. From the bookkeeping side of the house, if I donate ETO time, my ETO time is paid out of the higher rate than the house is ETO. Right. So that's the issue. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a really important issue. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
allowing employees to know what that expectation is, um, but also looking at where we are today and what employees want when they are coming on and that retention piece and allowing people to have that benefit and increasing that ETO, that's what, that's what employees today are looking for. Um, so I think there's a number of reasons why we um, are proposing this to you. Is the, is the personal policy um, is based on date of employment? So that's their year, or is it January, January, July, July? Nope. The, as soon as an employee is hired, they start earning. Um, so their ETO okay. immediately starts. Benefits, um, health, dental, vision start the first day of the month following the date of hire. So if you start in October, November 1st, you're eligible um, because that's the way that um, the administration set it up. Um, Beamers is the same the same thing. The date of hire, your first but, week, you're eligible for Beamers. But your question is when do we jump to the next level of accrual rate? Oh, I, I, um, I guess I'm thinking to those from each to a school year. So everybody's on no, the same date of hire. Date of hire. Yeah, yeah, so everyone is different. If you start in July, your benefits start in July, or your accrual rate starts in July. If I start in October, I'm starting my accrual rate in October. It's not on a fiscal year or a calendar year. It's on the, based on your date of hire. It's too bad, though, you know, talking about donating time and doing time away. Maybe, you know, why work concept too is different than a municipality, but like Judy said, I've had many times in my 40 years of concept too where somebody uses their all their time up and finds out they have cancer. And then they're out for three months to do a chemo. And our employees were allowed to give a week or a day or whatever. And we did, we gave 12 weeks one time and, and that employee knew who gave the time. And it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And I think it's sad you can't still do that. Well, because with ETO, it's more difficult. When back when we had the sick bank, right. and we had the personal time, the vacation time, then you were taking from your sick bank hours and giving to a sick bank hours over here. Right. Early time off covers all time off. Which too bad is just, uh, you know, a great set to it. Because with us, it was a day, you know. But that's when it doesn't short matter short. if I get 40 bucks an hour, you get 20 bucks an hour. <coughs> a day is a day. The short term right. disability is there for those employees who run into a health issues like you're talking about. And we've always worked with employees who've had to do it on numerous occasions, unfortunately, mm -hmm. where we have helped uh, the employees retain and use enough of their ETO time in order to continue to gain benefits, uh, such that they would continue to have coverage and income based mm -hmm. on the length of their, their being out. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, that's what a hardship is, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, you guys are going to take this back, you're going to read it, you're going to make a decision. So, yeah. if that's a well, decision, you guys have done a ton of work, you know, now I just I can't believe how out of date our personnel policies were and are, you know, but it's, it's a big pill to swallow when you want to eat. And this isn't everything that I would like to insert right. or address. I mean, this is literally has been in my new position and upstairs for three weeks or a month. Um, so it's been a lot, and then there's um, you know, the input from Eric and the input from Tina. We've got three of us that are working very hard on a lot, along with all the other projects that we're mm -hmm. trying to do. So it's it's the beginning, it's the beginning stages. I think we're moving in the right direction. And I'm excited that, you know, the three of us were able to, and I'm utilizing the LCT and Sherm, which I think, you know, are really awesome resources. And, the, you know, it's there are policies that a number of agencies, not just municipalities, are using. So I think I think we're getting there. And um, we've got most another important section which is coming up. So with the um, education leave, which is on page fourteen, section thirty-four. Um, actually, this was an area that Eric um, may even want to speak to. So the way that it read was education leave versus education reimbursement. So if read is, you know, it was all about an employee leaving their position to go further education. And then, um, and I don't think that that was the, so when we all sat down, Eric, uh, Tina and I, that's not how we wanted this to be um, the focus. We wanted the focus to be on the town um, supporting someone's education reimbursement, not them leaving to go do something and then hope that they come back. And it's kind of the way that it read to us. 
Um, so we added in a section, um, as you'll see in the blue, the 1500 per semester, trying to support someone who's doing further education for the position that they hold. Again, it's that you want employees when they're reading this to feel supported and that professional growth can be there. Um, so um, that's, those are the changes that we made there. And then my other section um, <coughs> that was more the date time that I wanted to address is on page 15. Oh, it's sorry, no, go back to the mm -hmm. um, $1,500 per semester. Is that considering that there's um, fall, winter, and summer, or how many semesters per year is that? That's, that's well, and it's also if you um, read it's based on to their budget. So you know, it's really up to the supervisor as well to be looking at their staff. Right. Um, but no, it's $1,500 per semester. They have to get their approval from their supervisor right. and they need to, um, it needs to be related to their position. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if, um, but it's all gonna be, I mean, we're not budgeting for every employee either to go out and yeah. further their education. So it's really, right, yeah. if, I think this is intended for a supervisor to see that one of their staff, I think of like the EMTs, um, needs right. additional, um, is gonna go further their education and it's going to benefit the town. And right, yeah. We're going to be very careful with this too. We don't want something that pertains to their job. Everyone yeah. going out and thinking that oh, it's in the you know budget for the for the town and they're going to pay for all. It. We have to be well, very I, yeah, careful with this. Like maybe I, I'm all for it, obviously, from my background. But I'm I'm wondering if um, if it makes sense to say to not just use the hundred dollar per semester semester and then also say like something about per year because um. Like some schools, I mean, I you know, like there's some sort of like going admission, and then you can keep like, I don't know, semesters might not be it's, it might not be uh, as clear. Just, you know, community like, community college would want to run the summer, yeah, summer exactly. semester, so to speak, right? I don't think yeah. we're there. So that would be I don't think like forty five hundred dollars a year. I mean, I'm if that's the budget, that's awesome. But I, I'm just, I seems like maybe. You well, in some places too, we'll have, if it's not about education for what you're doing, they pay 50%. But if uh, it is for something that it could be of you your job, it's mm -hmm. 100%. They're willing to. I've seen that many times. There's definitely a discussion that we have to have because obviously we budget, basically, we're, we're projecting <coughs> budgets now for a year out. So if someone's looking to do some educational growth, they would have to get a prior approval from their manager. The manager going to tell them if they come to them in January and say, hey, I'm I'm starting my semester here next week. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not on the budget. Well, we may have to find the money in the budget yeah. based on this this policy. That's what we're trying to be very careful when we word things because we don't. I don't want to have to budget money and have it sit there unused because, quite frankly, nobody has used this benefit. We want people to better themselves. People don't know about it. Well, well, well we just, the, the we wording just, of it is, talks about being that. Yeah, was it? It didn't say like so, education reimbursement. It was the way that it was written was very. Uh, it, and so, in um, once um, we finalize these changes, um, the goal is to sit down with the department heads and staff and to go through this and let them know the things that are changed. Like this is an area, you know, the ETO increasing from 240 to 320, but this is an area that will be discussed so that supervisors can, you know, get a feel from their staff and know which staffs are interested in that. So in the future they can budget for it, but right now it's not anything anybody's budgeting for because it's in that, this stage. Right. I'm going to ask a question as a maybe throw a monkey wrench in. <coughs> Since we're going to take this home and read mm -hmm. through it, would it be possible for the staff to look at it too and get input before we make the decision? So, Eric and Tina and I um, have gone through this, and with the sick reserve, I did meet with all of the staff to discuss that with them to get their feel. All of the staff that are currently have allergies. that have sick reserve, yes, not all the staff. yes, not all the staff, but the staff that are impacted mm -hmm. by that sick reserve, ending that sick reserve. But that is the um, extent that we have gone 
with involving employees. We, I, we could do that. I mean, I would rather if we were going to go and I'm stepping way out here because I'm not even um, discussing this air, air at first with, you know, to grab a group of people versus trying to meet with every employee mm -hmm. about what their feel is, mm -hmm. because then there's such a wide variety of opinions or wants or needs. You're going to have those employees that are going to think high level mm -hmm. for all. And then you're going to have employees that want things that benefit them. So I think, if that's what you're looking for, then we need to. Yeah, I think that's why building policies is an administrative function. I think to involve all the employees in building your policies mm -hmm. is impossible. It would be really consensus. difficult. It'll take us years to get the document together. We're trying to adjust what we have to bring it into the modern day and such a reality to it, yeah. uh, while looking out for the employees, but also looking out for the town as well. So I, I just don't know how we do it with all the employees involved. We have done it in one piece, but we have a financial impact on this one piece in fact the individual. Um, and there are there are options available to them. We didn't we did not want to come to the board and say, hey, we you change, make this change and then go back to the employees and say, Oh, by the way, guess what? You gotta make a decision now. Well the only way you could do it is if you took one section and did it like at a staff meeting, you know, not multiple things, just one thing and say, Okay, we focus on your budget over a long period of time. You know, that would be that would be positive, but but that's nice. it's not just this building. My rescue squad is not union personnel, right. so I've got to get everybody into the same room at the same time. Mm -hmm. that's just not <coughs> we used cost. to have a committee that did that, that met monthly, and there was like random people mm -hmm. just and they would do chunk by chunk, review it, and then get presented to you guys when I first started. Yeah, it wasn't hours, like it was just. Uh, just a just a few yeah. snapshot. Yeah. I'm just I'm just wondering about the ones that are well you talked about the current time. time. We need to talk to people about that. Mm -hmm. I mean the well, ones that are really I very, very impactful. Sorry, can you, I if I can, I've been here longest of anybody and seen all these policies come into effect, the reason that they were in effect and why they're not a good idea now. So I've seen all of that. And we really went through that with a fine tooth comb to benefit the employees and the administration. If you make this a group effort, you're never going to get, you're never going to get a policy passed, firstly. And secondly, I think as, as the select board, you guys need to make a decision of what you want in your policy, not take a poll from everybody. Because everybody's opinion is different because they're looking out for themselves. I really think that you know you guys need to look at that and decide if we think this is the best for the employees and the town because you have a unique perspective that you're not an employee and you're part of the town where what is is that that's why it's good that you guys adopt the policy because this doesn't directly affect you I understand what you're saying my thought process was, and I don't know, but I, I just said it in a particular idea, um, is that not, ha not having lived under this policy, like, I, I don't know what it feels like. Um, and so that's my, that's my concern. And I just want to make sure that... Um, uh, and I, I, you know, I, you know, I think an important piece too is in this position now that I have, I think that dialogue with employees is starting to open more. So although I might not, or we might not be as administration feel that's happening and there's a lot of information. I can assure you in the four weeks that I've been really doing this that I've gotten a lot of phone calls and I've had a lot of sit downs with whether it's EMS or even the police department individuals in this building. So I am getting feedback. I'm just not sitting down and saying, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Like I am getting feedback about vehicles and I'm getting feedback about employees time off and how they struggle to be able to get time off because of different um, deadlines. And so there is a feedback that I'm getting that I'm sharing with Eric and often. Um, it's just not 
a sit down formal. Right. And, and I think we'll get more of that yeah. as this plays out in my position. And, um, that, and probably the, the, the employees are aware that you're working on this mm -hmm. so that they would, I would think they would come to you to say, or to Bill or to somebody to just say their concerns. So that makes me feel a little bit better. And I, and I feel like my position isn't just for the employees or just for the town administration. I feel like my role is to be looking out for both. Mm -hmm. um, and everything that you learn right now about retention and hiring and is all about your employees. So I think it's really important that when we are looking at this, we're looking at it from both the employee and employee here. So when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about my benefits as well. And when I'm writing it, I'm thinking about this light board and I'm thinking about, you know, my supervisor, I'm thinking about all those components. And I think that, um, this is, like I said, it's the beginning phases. We're, uh, this is very new. This is more than I think has been, I don't know, we've been here for a while, Bob. I think this is the years. most has been updated or changed in a very, very long time. Yeah, we've discussed bits and pieces. Of and all I wasn't trying to throw it down your throat. Yeah, I knew she was going to chime in on it because she's been involved in all of that. I've been here for almost 17 years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I'd like to clarify one thing. I did not announce to all the staff that we were looking at these personnel policies. I, I feel strongly that this is a part, a primary part of my role as the town administrator to take a look at the policies when I step in here. What we've been doing this not for a few weeks, we've been doing this for months. Mm -hmm. We've been a, yeah. made aware of me to me that we have policies that have been approved by the select board that were never attached to the personnel policy. They float. They're they're in a file somewhere. All of a sudden we got a policy for that. So we've been trying to gather this stuff together for a very long time. So I didn't announce it to all the staff. It's just to me, it is a part of my role, a part of my function to look at policies as we go along. And this is our first, this is a culmination of months worth of work and trying to refine this, this document to make it much more clear. And when we do get a final document, I'm sure we will, there's an education piece here. I can tell you that we have part-time employees Oh, we have full-time employees that have never seen this document and never signed an acknowledgement letter. That's what I was going to ask. This, so, this should go to every employee when we hire them. So we and have to read it. it, 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 it will be as a part of our onboarding process. Again, the development HR department, which you supported, and I thank you, thank you. Long overdue. The onboarding started over a year ago here. We recognized as part of our HR process, even though we have a department in place, we didn't have an onboarding. We didn't have a proper hiring practice. We had we, we were lacking all of those formal processes. So we put those into place. We kind of built things as we went and then got the position filled. And now we're really working toward that implementation of these things. But we needed a baseline. We need a, a good solid baseline foundation to work from. Bill will continue to be refinements to this as time goes on, as, it's, as it should be. We'll look at it every year to see if a change has occurred that impacts one section or another. But this thing was such a mess, mm -hmm. if I may say, mm -hmm. um, with old outdated language and references in here that shouldn't have been, that we needed to do a major overhaul this summer. And that's what we're bringing to you. And my mistake for thinking we could just bring this and say, hey, read this. Yeah, no, my mistake, I actually just- Sign off on it, but it's, uh, it, you know, we. We're, we feel pretty strong, but there were certainly some pieces in here I just picked up tonight. Uh, you know, the whole definition of a part time employee. I mean, very simple. If you don't work 40 hours, you're a part time employee. Okay? But we do have a reference in here in some of the language. It says part time employee. So we need to define part time employee. Uh, yeah, back in section 22, I earned time off. I think, I think most of the document is pretty, pretty easy to understand. Yes. I think it's the third sick time, but it's not something in my wheelhouse and I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. So for me to talk, um, to digest it so I can understand it. Yep. But the rest of it, using uh, well, uh, equipment that the town owns, like that. Yeah, so I think it's me, I, you know, essentially I try and take this and I just said to Eric this morning after reading it again this weekend because I I have read and read and read this and added to it and added to it because there's so many things that aren't addressed the travel the the vehicle usage um, 
So I just sent it in this morning. I just sort of want to just strip it all down and start from scratch. But I also have this next section and then I'm going to leave you guys alone. Um, and I almost said to Eric, maybe this is too much, but um, the next section and maybe there's a way for us to amend the current, I don't know, Eric, you can let me know if I'm stepping out of my lane here. Um, this on page 15, the um, paragraph right above section 36 references the uh, overtime for the superintendent and the foreman, which would be what I was referring to earlier about the um, date impact that we wanted to take effect um, in December. So probably a little bit more why I um, and I'll take ownership of this, was wanted to present this to you. One, I, there's so much that needs to be addressed. It's just easier to deal with personnel when you have a document to go to that spells it out um, instead of making administrative decisions. But this is the section that sort of pushed this probably to be presented right. tonight. Well, we should have read because, okay. <laughs> because maybe I should have left it out. But we also didn't want to make a changes every three months and drag you guys through this because you have other business that's as important, if not more important, than this personnel policy. So I think my recommendation. I think at this point, if we receive the headlock from the board, that this would be a paragraph that you would approve on the final package. Mm -hmm. And then we can implement this in the payroll office. And then when we get this finalized, it'll already be in play. So page 15. Yeah. Yeah, 15. that's page 15 section. It's, Basically, this year, yeah. it takes our superintendent, our two foremen, and puts them on the same level playing field with our union, union highway guys. So when they come out at night, the pay is the same. Right now, we have two different pay structures. And the foreman and supervisors have to accumulate 40 hours before they begin to get their overtime rate. But they, they're on call. We don't do on-call pay. We really don't want to go down that road. Uh, we're paying for what they get, but for what, what they give us for work, so. And I think it's very fair. Again, it's, it's, I'm not benefiting yeah. from this, and neither is Eric, so it's something that we do feel is fair. It puts them in line with the, the union employees, so they're all paid outside of the normal work schedule all the time. So this mm -hmm. paragraph is for those two? It's for those, two, the, the, yep, the superintendent and the two foremen. Sounds good to me. So do you need a motion just for that? I, I'm going to think I'm going to think on the head note from the board that if the board supports that one paragraph, we can implement that. I'll send an email to Tina for the time record. On behalf of the board, we'll implement that section only. And then we'll come back when we're finding get the document finalized. And that will be a part of the, part of the final product. Okay? Um, I, I don't want these guys, I don't want to have to deal with retro pay. Now we're we'll continuing to go back retro on this stuff. It's just another hassle and time eater. So um, if I've seen a lot of head on the board, so I'm going to say there's a, a, an agreement here for that, if that small section on page 15. And that's what I need for these yeah. employees because they've been asking and waiting for me um, to give them that answer. And so I apologize for, I should have gone with my first instinct and waited and not presented this to you this evening. Yeah. Well, essentially they're going to be paid over time. They work more than an eight-hour day, not 40 hours. They're, when they come in in the middle of the night, they the, the superintendent foreman currently, they aren't getting overtime until they've got 40 hours accumulated in the pay week. So uh, the other guys are coming in. When they come in the middle of the night, they're on overtime. Their normal payday is from 7 to 3.30, daytime hours. If you pull the guys in at night, they're on overtime until 7 a.m. And from 7 to 3.30, they're on straight time. That's for the yeah. power truck driver? Yes. Mm -hmm. they're, that's they're, because, they're, because their lives are completely dysfunctional for six months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> their family sacrifice a lot, and this is a compensation plan that works. Uh, so they're. We plan, that's what I'm talking about. And that's if they're called in, though. So if the uh, superintendent or the foreman direct them to come in at five o'clock the next morning if they schedule them the day ahead of time then they've adjusted their hour so it doesn't impact that but there's often times where they have to be called in because the weather is what it is in vermont 
Um, but if they are scheduled the day before to come in at five, that's not at over. Oh. So the gusts, they try to be very good at looking at the weather and reviewing that and saying, okay, the storm's coming in yeah. at six, we want you in at five, then they would not be paid for that at all okay. the time. The only time they will do that for snowstorm maintenance is if we have one of those big storms that Gary Sadowski's here turns white over <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, they're predicting two feet of snow. Then they will so tell them at the end of the previous day, just plan on coming in at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, it's a, it starts straight time at 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the junior guys, the, the highway guys, part of this will keep receiving straight time until they get eight hours from there all the time. If they come to clean the streets after a snowstorm, you know, two nights later they've got some rest, they come out in the middle of the night to clean up the piles and haul the snow away, that is a scheduled work day that's straight time. It's the call outs that get the meal works on there. That's good. Thank you all for your feedback. Yeah. Sorry to stress you all out. I just wanted to thank <laughs> Just wanted to test three. you to see how well you did. Thank you guys for, for all the work you've done on this. And obviously it's, it's a huge project. And I apologize for our responsiveness. No, but we, no, I we want that. to really understand it all. And I, I respect that. I would rather you just come back with feedback than to just say yep and yeah, I well, it's would, too important I think that. it's way too yeah, yeah. I, impacts, I, impacts the yeah. well I'm, I'm glad you folks are taking that step I appreciate uh, it I think it gives us a, another set of eyes another mm -hmm. I just want to add if you're looking at this stuff at home whatever and you have a question of why it is like it is okay. call, call no call Paula because <laughs> <laughs> No, because it's important that you understand why things are the way they are. They're written a certain manner for a reason. Yeah. And it's good research for me, too, because I have, I don't know the history. Like, I had to go to Tina this morning to ask her when the sick bank was established and when it turned into sick reserve. I don't have that historical data. So the questions, I love research, and that's why I've enjoyed this so much is because I get to go on a showroom, I get to go to VLCT, I get to take all this data and try to come up with something that's incredible for you guys for the town and for the employees so the questions I welcome them they help me be better at my job well, thanks for taking on the role of human resources we'll be in asking questions yeah no it's good <laughs> I'll go with it is there anything more you want to go with? no <laughs> <Thanks. Perfect. laughs> I, took I took enough to check your time up you want more I got all right, <laughs> turn to page. <clears throat> Next, old business. For the warrant. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by the meeting, second by Ryan. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Warrant for them to <clears throat> Next, TA report. Uh, TA was absent. Last week. So, uh, yeah, uh, so my report is going to be limited to a couple of announcements on behalf of our community development coordinator. Uh, we'll start with uh, the turkey trot, 5k run walk. All products will go to the one community food chair. The race starts at 9 a.m. at People's Academy. Registration $15 per person, 12 members free. First place of each group will get a prize. Uh, this is on Thanksgiving Day, folks. Thanksgiving morning. So you get to walk or run off, whatever you're about to ingest. So, uh, registration starts at 8 a.m. on race day, um, November 24th at 9 a.m. Can, can I add to that? Yeah. Registration, I want to stay on. You go, girl. <laughs> I'm running the registration. The registration is really online through our rec, my rec portal. If you show up on race day to register, you're going to have to register online on the my rec portal. Do it at home. If you have questions, reach out. Are you ready, Sarah? I'm walking. <laughs> and that's through the town website, Sarah? Yeah, okay. so there's a link on the homepage of the town. Mm -hmm. There's the picture, that orange picture. And it links. Right to the register. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. And the second one is uh, the 22nd Annual Festival of Rights, Saturday, December 3rd. There's a whole list of activities going on that day to include meeting Santa and Mrs. Claus, 
including <coughs> for cookies and pictures that we're all so excited. Um, all kinds of fun stuff going on. It's available, it's all available on the town website, I believe. It's eventual stuff there. Lots of work goes in behind these events. Uh, most of it volunteer, uh, and it's, it's wonderful. I have the turkey trial, the brand new event that is a student that came to us from people's academy uh, that wanted to do this and came to Trisha, and of course, that energy is infectious, so she ran with it. Uh, so they are partnering up with this uh, student and taking it to the end. So we're going to see those two. That's all uh, I have. I can tell you that the staff is phenomenal. I, uh, I had no worries being out last week, other than worrying about my, my work building up a little bit. Uh, but the staff here really is on all the pilots. They know their jobs so well. Uh, very little, uh, I would call them because the kids weren't calling me to tell me what they were doing, right? So anyway, no, I would call them and uh, just check in, make sure they're going along. Well. They just, they did a phenomenal job last week in my absence. So very much appreciate uh, all they do and the skills they bring to the town of the Thank you. Any questions for Eric? Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> Next, select for concerns. Don. So I, I have one topic I'm going to talk about. Um, as anybody who's been to any of these meetings knows, you know, housing in town, development in town is one of the big issues that I'm talking to many people. And as has been talked about here at the board, and the Judy's talked about it, I've talked about it, probably all of us have talked about it at some point, the need for housing the homelessness in town, the people that are looking for housing. And um, it's been suggested to me a couple of times that maybe the numbers that have been thrown out there aren't as real as we've suggested that they are. And so I took it upon myself to <clears throat> call Emily Rosenbaum, who uh, sends us the numbers pretty well every week. And I said, so I don't know, where, where do these numbers come from? Like, what is the source of these numbers? And so she pretty quickly sent me over to Capstone. And so last week I had uh, the opportunity to go over to Capstone, and I would encourage anybody in this room who's interested in this, please go to Capstone. We have an incredible resource right here in Morristown. And uh, when I got there, Katrina uh, James had already planned the presentation, took me for a tour. A chance to see or meet with all, all the individuals that are working there and they're getting a sense of the work that um, they are doing. They're doing a tremendous amount of work. And I guess going back to how I started this little, little discussion, found out pretty quickly that, yeah, the numbers aren't real. Of course they're real. Not only are they real, but they're, they're, uh, they're under what the real numbers are. Because the numbers that are being reported are the people that are walking in people that are reaching out and looking for help, and there's undoubtedly more people out there. So I wanted to say that because uh, I just wanted to perhaps try and end that conversation that maybe there was um, not the need that some have expressed. I would say, having a look at it quite a bit myself, that the need is is, is bigger than that has been expressed. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a set, and what, and, there's a variety of reasons for it. I'm not going to go into them all right now, but I would suggest that you know, people that are, um, that are concerned about it, concerned about housing development in this town, really take a look at it. Because it's out there, it's real. We see it. We see it all around town. And thanks. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Don. Very good. Just to follow up on that, the numbers from Emily uh, recently, she just sent this to us today. 125 households, 153 adults, and 62 children experiencing or at risk of homelessness. 96 are experiencing literal homelessness. Um, general assistance program, we're in a tent on the street and they are looking for a temporary shelter. Um, you know, fellows coming to our house for Thanksgiving. It's the apartment place. Either under renovation or is it and insurance, there is uh, rent that has increased and uh, he's living into sunset. He's working. And so uh, I I don't have any solutions and answers to all this, but it's something to be aware of. I'm sure 
bill and the work that you do, you see a lot of uh, people on, living in the margins. We are their primary health care. Yeah. And I know back during the pandemic, you had asked, you had mentioned that when you go, when you and your folks go into people's homes, you look in the refrigerator to see how things are going there. Yeah. And you do an assessment based on that too, which is very very beneficial. I don't think a lot of people know that that's what you do to help people out. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Yes. Um, I don't have any concerns today. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'm just going to thank you for everybody and all the people that did hear this job in front of <laughs> Great bunch of guys. Thanks, Brian. And I'm upset. I think uh, both Tom and Judy said it really well. I really, really like hearing that. Thanks, Brian. All right. Other business. Number one, the possible executive. You jumped over. Mm -hmm. Jump over. Oh, inadvertently. <laughs> Freudian slip. I tell you, that wasn't intended. Who was going to say something first? I was going to go. Thank you. Sorry. Community concerns. Do we have any community concerns? Right. Jamie, come to the microphone. Welcome. I'm sorry. I no, that's all right. You're good. Uh, James Brewster, Morristown. Uh, just two community concerns, comments, however you want to uh, phrase them. Um, I don't know how to read this. Glasses on, glasses on. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a conversation about the community concerns section and whether it should happen or it shouldn't. Um, and I thought about that. Um, actually had a conversation with Eric about it, really good one. Um, thought I would share my thoughts uh, with the board. Uh, and to begin with, uh, I'd like to say that I do agree uh, with what uh, Eric had been saying about uh, this portion of the meeting uh, being about thoughts and comments directed at you folks or to you folks um, and not a two-way conversation. Um, uh, if deemed necessary, uh, things that come up at these community concerns, a uh, resident could be contacted uh, later after an investigation has been done about what their comment was. Uh, or it could possibly be put on as a future uh, agenda item. Um, continuing on with that, um, if one of the concerns about this particular portion of the meeting is about legal concerns about the agenda or this, that, or the other, um, I'm wondering if the select board concerns and the TA report might need to be treated in the same way in that when you folks are speaking select board concerns, it didn't really happen this evening, but they have sort of turned into conversations in the past so that perhaps in the select board concerns portion, you speak, but then you don't end up, you know, it doesn't end up in a discussion for the same reasons as, as the community concerns. Um, additional comments, you know, it's a valuable portion of the meeting. Um, residents want to be heard. Um, they want to be heard by the board, not just one person. They want to be heard by all of you. And they actually, you know, I think they want to be seen being heard in front of other people, you know, so other people hear what they, what they have to say. And that opportunity isn't really given anywhere else, but here at this meeting. Um, so, you know, I, I worry that by placing additional restrictions, and by that I mean that this is now at the end of the meeting, not where it used to be, um, that additional restrictions on the community concerns portion of the meeting are going to drive residents to more posting on the front page forum, to more social media outbursts, um, which I don't think is what anybody wants. Um, I don't have the answer. Um, I think it's something for you folks to, to think about, but I think that there is a risk of forcing it the other way, which is the front page forum avenue, which is I don't think what anybody wants and what isn't very helpful at all. Um, so those are my comments on the community concerns. Um, and if I run over my three minutes, please let me know and I'll stop. Right. 
Okay. Um, lastly, I'm just going to take a stab in the dark uh, and say that tonight's executive session is about the Duke Hamill Pit. Um, just looking at who's in attendance here and the way the agenda is set up. Uh, and I'm going to just say uh, I'm really concerned as to whether an executive session to discuss that is really needed. Um, you know, this is all about something that's part of an Act 250 permit, which is a very public process to begin with. Um, so I'm not quite sure why additional conversations need to be held outside the public view. Um, does the requirement uh, premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage? That's one of the criteria for going in to an executive session. Does that really apply here? I don't know if it does or not. You'll all have to make that decision for yourself. Uh, just because you meet the requirements to enter executive session doesn't mean you have to. Um, and lastly, uh, the agenda says after this, discuss blah, 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 blah. And I find that not just in this one particular item, but I found it before very confusing because the items on the agenda will say, we're going to discuss this. And next thing you know, there's a vote taking place. And I, I think that there is an assumption sometimes, there was certainly in mind in the beginning was, well, we're just going to talk about it. And there was no assumption that there was going to actually be a vote taken. So I'm wondering if in future agendas that that might be reworded um, somehow so that a person who is reading the agenda would say, oh, hey, they're going to talk about it, but they're going to vote on it as well. Uh, that's just a for me and how I've run into that problem looking at the agenda in the past. Now, that may be how agendas work worldwide. Uh, just throwing it out there as a comment. So, thank, oh, thank you very much. That'll do. Um, thank you. Any other Go ahead. Hi. Introduce yourself, please. Mary Nichols, uh, living in Morrisville, and I'm on the Mac board, Morrisville Alliance of Commerce and Culture. And uh, thank you, Tyler, for your donation recently. We have a very generous group of sponsors in this town, Union Bank. Um, and what we provide on December the 3rd, uh, Judy, I, I appreciate you talking about marginalized. I think you're trying to direct it. It is such a wonderful time for people to do things at Christmas time that are free. We see people with their kids come and they don't have to pay anything for the horse ride. They don't have to pay anything to see Santa and get cookies. They can go over to River Arts and do some projects. They go to the library and they have cocoa and soup and projects. And these little kids, we have disabled people come that get on the um, horse cart rides. It's really important to see people come back out for the community and we raise money and we really appreciate it. And I just want to you know how important it is for people to have free things to do that they don't have to pay any money and then get a little something and have a little joy. We really need that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other community concerns tonight? <coughs> okay. We move to other business now. Number one, possible, possible executive session. I move to find that premature general public knowledge of pending and proper civil litigation for prosecution to which the public body is a main party to fully place its now at a substantial disadvantage of slowing these negotiations that I move that we enter executive session to discuss the pending or probable litigation for prosecution under the provisions of Title I, Section 293A1 of my statutes to include Eric Dodge, Town Administrator. And Brooke, you know that I'm determined. And Tyler. Tyler. And Tyler. Thank you. I have a motion by John to second. Second. Second by Judy. Any further discussion? I have a quick question. Go ahead, Judy. Um, will Zoom come back? I'm assuming this is probably going to take a little while. And uh, I mean, I could sit outside and wait and I can come back. Or if the Zoom is going to come back up when you folks are done. I'll go home and tune in from there. Okay. If you want me to stay, I can stay and work in my office and pop Zoom back up. The problem is, Jamie, you're not going to know when Zoom comes back up unless you just want back in. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to shut it down. Okay. Well, I can, I mean, 
I mean, if you had any idea how long this discussion was going to be, you know, I'd stick around. Um, okay. Um, well, I think the board needs to make a decision whether or not they're going to continue on by the Zoom this evening, so I know what I'm doing. Right, yeah. So, we have it in the past. We have combat funds in there. Right, right. So, the agenda item we discussed today, we'll put the new options, is already on there. It's the one I added at the beginning as a duplication. Right. You know, what I added. Mm -hmm. uh, my eyes. Uh, so, discussing the Hamilton legal options. You're going to be, be discussing things with your engineer and your attorney about the permit we received in the mail from uh, Pat Two Fifty. And based on that conversation, you may or may not decide to take a legal uh, an, an action. So we have to have an agenda item for it for there to be an action. Yeah. So that's why that's on there. It doesn't mean you're going to. It just gives you the option to discuss that. That's why it's listed as a discussion. So it, so that's. Potentially taking place during the executive session. We are going to come out of the executive session and talk about that. Yeah, so you'll complete, your, you'll complete your executive session. If there is a decision to make a motion relative to that discussion, it'll be made in open and public meeting. Right, but the discussion around. But if there's no, right, so if I'm not here and I'm not there, going to participate in the discussion, you guys have already had your discussion about Correct. it. Right, so hence the discuss versus vote confusion part of the, you know, the agenda. So uh, I'll just go home and um, you want this one? I didn't I didn't I didn't oh, sorry. Uh, the motion to come up. I made the motion. Yeah, I second it. Thank you. Um, um, okay. Okay. So, do we still have a motion to attend the meeting or no? No. no. no.